Today, I'm talking to another inventor of our time, and this time it's Friedhelm Hillebrand, who invented SMS back in 1984. Hello, Mr. Hillebrand. Hello, Mr. Dröge. Nice to meet you. Well, likewise. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's first start a bit with your history. How did you actually happen to become an engineer and in telecommunication? How did that start? Well, I mean, um, I was interested as a boy already on technical things since my father was uh, head of a department in a factory which produced ch anchoring chains for ships. And hence, uh, hence, I was interested in ships. And as a young, I was uh, in this factory, of course, electrical things existed and uh, nobody understood this. Everybody had big fear. And so I wanted to know what this electrical things is. Then I started to build model ships and model airplanes. And then the question of, air co of radio control came up. And uh, so I came to radio communications more or less. Then I came to amateur radio. And on this path, I finally came to studying uh, electronic communications and uh, became a communications engineer. Ah, it was a family business kind of. So uh, your, fam uh, your, your father had this interest, this job, and this is how you got interested into electronics yourself. Well, my, my father was, had, was, it was, did not own the factory. He was the head of a department uh, which produced anchoring chains for ships mm -hmm. and chains for the mining industry. and. Uh, we lived in in uh, in the office building of this factory, and so I had a very early, interesting ter territory to explore. Ah, so as you were living in the same building, you were constantly in touch with that topic. Yeah. Ah, I see. I see. And um, actually, why telecommunication? I, how did that happen? Was that planned, or was that coincidence? No, I mean, this was uh, simply it came uh, the, the, my hobbies developed from building uh, building ship models and uh, and then radio control to amateur radio. And when I uh, completed my high school, I, I was a, a radio amateur with already two years experience. And uh, hence uh, telecommunications was, uh, of course, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good, pretty near choice. But at that time, you pioneered with SMS, it, the kind of mobile um, came into a topic. That wasn't a topic back then when you started. Um, I think, yeah, Marty Cooper invented the mobile phone. It was 1974 he invented the mobile phone. This can be. Yeah. So, so what did you do before? What was I mean, your... I mean, this... Uh... This mobile phone is not an isolated development. I mean, in in radio communications, point-to-point -point communications, you had portable equipment already in my young years, and uh, it was of course little bricks uh, and so and and. Uh, but this was point-to-point -point communication, and then the I think the big invention is the cellular networks, uh, where the uh, where you have a network where you have a repeated pattern of base stations, 
and where the uh, where then the uh, the mobile is uh, registered in the network, and if and if you have a communication uh, a an incoming call, mobility there is mobility management which uh, seeks the mobile, and uh, this I mean is the real real big big thing which enabled uh, what we see these days. Uh, this was first, of course, used by car-mounted stations and then uh, hand portables. And uh, this uh, invention of, of Marty Cooper, hand portable in a cellular environment. Of course, for, for amateur radio purposes or military purposes, such paint portables existed long time already. The interesting thing is that uh, the logics the, uh, that these things could communicate in a cellular network it was the big, big thing which he did do, and the miniaturization which belongs to this. But it wasn't very, um, it wasn't really minimum, I mean, back back then in the 70s it was minimum, but two kilos to, to, to hold it, and it had a big battery and like 20 minutes speaking time, so. Yeah, but I mean, this is uh, then only uh, little little progress in small steps uh, but the the question for this is a concept that you that you conceive that you could have such equipment also a portable hand portable and not only in cars where you would have a power station uh, in the car where you could have unlimited power and uh, also with this invention an important step in communication came to life namely communication became personal. I mean, this is one of the big success factors for SMS, that it is a personal and global communication. Uh, you do, did, did not receive the, uh, the incoming messages at the time at a computer, which was in somewhere in an office uh, building. Or if you want to send something, you did not need to go to, to an office building or to, to your home. You had these things in in the in the in your pocket, and this is a big big thing. And then this leads to also to what we see today that you have the internet in your pocket, <laughs> and, and practically everything in your pocket. And and if you look, you have today something like six billion mobile users of the internet and only one billion fixed users. So the the more the mobile users outperform the number of of, of fixed users. And this gives a total change of, of the, in the nature of communications, that you are reachable everywhere, you can communicate everywhere. Um, but for this, you needed to have this global mobile platform, which was created first by the GSM standard, then enhanced by the, the 3G UMTS standards, and now by the 4G LTE standards. So you, you have been involved with communication long before mobile phones were invented. Yeah. By by amateur radio and um, and mobile communication, as is said by the military and other users, before we had um, mobile phones for end users. So, um, how did you actually invent the the SMS? How did you get the idea? Um, I I read in one interview you gave that you said, um, for you personally, you wanted to enable the world to send instant global messages to each other without further delay? Well, I mean, uh, this, uh, this uh, concept, I, I have invented the concept. All, all the technical details, a lot of architectural things have been done by others. Uh, but the idea for this concept came, came in, the, in the work for a mobile telephony system. We, we had a uh, development in Europe. In Europe, we had uh, uh, mobile communication systems, car, car mobile stations, uh, only on a nation, national basis. They could not communicate in other countries. And finally, in the late 80s, uh, the network operators came together and agreed to uh, create a standard and a system which would work uh, first Europe-wide and then uh, worldwide. And it was decided that this should be optimized for telephony, since telephony was the mo most pr pressing, uh, most pressing application and most pressing need. And then 
I had been working before in, uh, in data communications. That was my last project before. I was responsible for the national packet switching network in Germany, DataXP, you might recall. And um, then I did sit down and thought, thought what could be done for, for data applications on such a mobile telephony network. And uh, I've created concepts for a set of, for a range of services, but I wanted to have also one very basic service, which you could do without connecting additional terminals to a mobile station. And then I looked at a mobile station, uh, even the car mounted stations at the time had uh, this keypad to generate a message. There were uh, characters on the keypad. There was a display for telephony purposes. So one could generate a message, could also display a message. Then the question how would you tra transmit a message uh, re remained. And then I looked for mobile telephony. Uh, you needed, you had uh, voice channels and you had so-called control channels, which uh, had the purpose of steering the communications. And then I thought these uh, control channels were at a very low usage. They were used less than 1% of the time. So uh, if they could be used uh, on a second priority basis for sending messages, uh, this, this would be the solutions. And this was uh, the concept, to use these channels on a second priority basis, uh, basis. And then one issue remained, what do you do if the, mobiles, if the, uh, if the recipient mobile station is not reachable, be, be it switched off, be it in, uh, not in radio coverage. And for that I invented uh, the need to have a server, uh, we would say today a server in the network, which would receive the message and would store it until the recipient mobile would be uh, online again. Uh, this uh, server was called uh, M uh, SMSC, SMS Center. And this is a key point for the success of SMS, that so that SMS is really sent to the recipient as soon as it is technically possible. But and nowadays, so this, was, this, was, this was the concept, mm. and this concept I brought, I discussed with the French, and we brought this to standardization and brought it to life. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> the um, the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. Or was that another um, organization? ITU, ITU had not succeeded in creating mobile standards for, for, for years. And this was an, a European effort. It was in the CEPT, in the framework of the European Post and Telecommunication Administrations. It was the working group GSM. It was then still French terminology, Group Special Mobile. Ah. Um, and there had been an allocation of 900 megahertz spectrum in 1982. And uh, there was a standardization activity starting in, in 1982, but uh, taking speed only at the end of 84. And uh, we brought this into this uh, context. And at that time, you could uh, reach a decision that such a feature would be mandatory for every mobile station. And this was a key point for my idea. I propose really to have it mandatory for each mobile station. And since in the mobile station it meant only a piece of software, we could get this decision pretty early already in 1985. And this is also a key point that every phone which is delivered worldwide has the functionality. Mm. So that means that means it was just a firmware update for, for the stations, actually a software update. It was, kind of. uh, it was it was built in, uh, built in when they uh, when they were delivered from the factory. Ah. So it was pres it was prescribed by by, uh, by technical regulation that each fa each phone must have this functionality. So this uh, double functionality of the keypad that you have A B C D E F and so on. So three letters, three signs per key um, on the mobile phones was also. A part of your concept? Yes, of course, but that existed before. I mean, that was used, used for mnemonic uh, dialing in the United States, for instance. Yes, but I remember, I think in Germany, it was not really, and still is not really that much used for, for home phones, despite it's, I still have it on mine, of course. So, but, but here in Germany, you don't really see the, the name of the, of the numbers, the translation. 
we still use we still use the the number instead of letters yeah it's uh, not really possibly it's it's caused by the late late uh, deregulation and and a late introduction of competition i mean in the us you can i was shocked once in in, in chicago i found in the underground a advertisement uh, if you have troubles with your uh, with your marriage partner call uh, call 800 di divorce Okay. D I V O R C E, and then you would get an attorney who would look, look after your case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's quite interesting. So, um, how did you actually get the idea of the limitation of 160 shards? I read in another interview that was because it was the number of shards you could put on a postcard. No, it was uh, it was um, by this. Um, usage of the control channel the control channel has a packet size which is uh, which is of which is limited and which leaves uh, just these 160 characters for these messages this was the reason it was a hard technical reason mm. and mm. but but this uh, this leads to an interesting question if you have a concept which has such, li such limited capabilities is this interesting at all for the end user and uh, when I came, came discussed this first within the German telecommunications uh, organization, they all laughed at me. Uh, I tried to, to interest the people who were responsible for ISDN to standardize this function also in the ISDN, uh, so that we would have a good fixed network uh, extension of this service. But they rejected this since this would be by far too outdated and too old-fashioned they talked about 64 kilobit per second and such things and no no uh, no limitation of length there's no not no no telecommunication service where you have a limitation of the length of the message and so the question was uh, is it is it has this still value for the customer and then i did sit down and uh, asked myself where is the value and uh, then i i used looked at postcards and they don't have much more. I looked at fax. You might recall these fax forms, which were very popular some some years ago, where you insert just two or three sentences and then put it on the fax machine. They do not hold much more information. Or if you look at, at the time when I did this work, telex was still very popular. Telex messages were also short. So there is, and, and then I created also a number of, of messages in, in, let me say, daily situations to see whether such a service has, has a value for the customer at all. Since we did not have any market uh, market uh, research, uh, and, and so then I found that this would have merits, and the technical concept was so that uh, it did not require much investments, since it, the only investment in uh, the terminal was, in, in the terminal it was a bit of software, and in the network it was more or less this additional server, uh, and that is not much compared to the cost of, of a network, and so uh, so this this went then into life, and uh, and when it, when it came into life, nobody wanted to use it in the beginning. You might recall, uh, and then the youngsters discovered it, and, and since uh, some of the operators did offer it for free, and they and it became very popu popular for the young people. And That's all, quite and, true. Yeah. And only from there it took the market then. By, by storm. Interestingly, you mentioned that you made sure that um, the message would be delivered when the recipient was online again or still had or again had coverage. But I think I recall most services nowadays, they have like a 24 ti hours time limit. Yeah, this, of course, is a parameter which the network operator can set or which even the user can set. The user, this is, depends on the operator. Uh, this is programmable how, how, for how long time the MSC stores the message. But in principle, the idea was to store it as long as until the uh, mobile station is registered, the recipient is registered back on the network. <laughs> That's quite interesting. For example, most people nowadays don't know that you can add a code in front of the SMS for delivery notification. Yeah, well, I mean, there are many possibilities which are not exploited anymore, but uh, 
But, uh, and there is also the problem that the network operators did not invest in the further development of the servers. Because it's outdated technology? No, no, no. It simply they, they had so such a big business and they liked this big business and they simply were spoiled by the success. Uh, and you shouldn't forget, in 2008, the global turnover was 100 billion US dollars for the network services. 100 billion US dollars. And for that, each operator needed just a few servers. And I mean, this is... Uh, Unbelievable that operators do not uh, develop things further. Take a simple thing. You cannot send an SMS to two addresses. You cannot copy it to anybody. Or you cannot attach uh, these days a picture of, I mean, this is... Um, but but I think this is developed further in the something called MMS, right? This was a This was an effort to do this, but this was uh, really uh, a type of, should we say, bricolage, pastelai, I don't know what it is in English. It was not a, this was done by some people in, in some manufacturers. It was not really a serious effort. <laughs> and it was also not successful in the market. Well, that's true. I, I think I have received one SMS in my life. MMS? Okay. Uh, sorry, MMS. One MMS in my life, yeah. And that was a picture somebody sent from Bulgaria or something. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so the SMS thing is not uh, the MMS thing is not really um, a standard. That's interesting. Um, it is standard, but it is not successful. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's also by the uh, by the. I mean, uh, they have very uh, very high charges. I think that's between seventy five cents and uh, and a euro or so. I mean, this is totally totally out of any proportion well i guess it's cheaper to just send an, uh, an email with your mobile phone and attach the picture to it yeah this is of course um, this is of course the development i mean now you have email on each mobile phone uh, then the market opportunities for such services disappear now oh, it's, it's interesting that you say it disappeared i mean um, if you look at the development nowadays, uh, short message services still exist, but they changed faces a bit, you know? I mean, nowadays you have Twitter, where you even have less space per message, 140 characters. That's even 20 characters less than SMS. And it's still very yeah. successful. Yeah, well, I mean, Twitter has additional functionalities. You, you can be, be this follower, you can send to groups, and etc. And you can attach photos and uh, and etc uh, etc et this is what what is uh, what was really uh, well neglected in, in the SMS uh, evolution so if if you had if you had the decision to develop SMS further it would have been something like that you would have expanded the standard yeah of course of course but, 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 there is, but there is also, uh, a, this, this was, is one route to go. And then there is a, a second route to go uh, by the possibility of the mobile internet. Uh, and that is the route which what, WhatsApp has gone. Uh, and uh, this is of course, uh, and, and Twitter also to some extent. Uh, Twitter also uses, uh, uses uh, the mobile internet possibility. Um, and. Uh, if you look at, at WhatsApp, I mean, if you the 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 whole uh, whole framework has changed by the advent of the mobile internet, the u, u, ubiquitous availability of mobile internet on all phones, all with flat rates. If you uh, connect then a server to the internet and offer some end user service, then you immediately can have services worldwide uh, without additional cost, additional transmission cost. So every stu every two or three students can uh, connect a server, program something, and offer it to the whole world. <laughs> I mean, this is a, a totally changed uh, framework. And uh, if you look, I first didn't understand what 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 WhatsApp did do, uh, but they j simply grasped then 700 million users, and they had no intention to collect money from their users, but they wanted just to blow up the company, and then they sold the company, and that that was their that was their profit. And now it belongs it's to Facebook. Totally, totally different business models. Uh, 
I mean, the, the, uh, the, this is certainly a, a disruptive situation by, by the advent of the mobile internet. So the network operators with their competence and with the large po deep pockets they have, they could have uh, seized this uh, spot if they wanted. So you think it's um, it's a lack of willing to de um, to develop services further by the operators. This is uh, this is I mean uh, if you look at, at SMS, it's a pretty old service. It's it's in operation more than than twenty years. And if you see how many services from that time have disappeared, who talks about bildschirm text? Who talks about teletext? And and you name it. Who talks about fax? And uh, SMS is still in operation with the with the very limited functionality. What I only regretted is that they have not taken from this large profits they have made a small amount and have uh, added functionalities like group communications, uh, presence functions, and such things. This is one thing. And the other thing is, of course, one must realize that with the advent of the mobile, ubiquitous global mobile internet, uh, uh, the whole uh, situation changes. And interesting that you mentioned a limitation of SMS, because I'm still, I'm still sending a lot of SMS, and I'm still receiving a lot of SMS from my iPhone. And I know that on my iPhone, compared to my old uh, Siemens S C5 from 1999, the the SMS experience changed a lot. I mean, nowadays I don't have a limitation of 160 shards, and I even can send SMS to m more than one person at a time. But I think this is probably some trick, some workaround they are using in the software. Of, of the operating system of my mobile phone, of my smartphone, rather than something SMS offers as a technology. Yes, this is the case. I mean, this is uh, uh, um, Apple offers uh, a user a homogeneous uh, user experience. And if uh, it, it hides whether it uses SMS or uses iMessage, uh, like, like a transmission like, like WhatsApp. And uh, if you send, want to send a SMS to two SMS users, then they send simply two SMSs. And this is also not a problem anymore, since all people do have a, a, a pretty large number of SMS in their flat rate uh, these days. So uh, this is, does not create additional cost. Also, SMS itself, the, the hard limitation of 160 characters has disappeared over time. Since uh, they're, they're in the SMS standardization, uh, they have in, uh, introduced the concatenation of several uh, SMS containers. So, and there is also a parameter how many you can, can concatenate. Since the channel is uh, from the terminal is still relatively slow, mo so most operators set this to six containers. So normally in an SMS service these days, uh, you you have the content of six uh, SMS containers as, as limitation. And then this does then not play a practical role in, in your communications. Also, I agree the, keyboard, the keypad uh, on modern uh, touch, touch screen uh, phones is a big, big advance. Uh, it, it eases it very, very much to create these texts. Yeah, I see this myself. And it's really, I, I write myself also more SMSs than in previous times. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting. But there's one, and one thing I noticed that is quite a problem. Some services, they even allow you uh, less than 160, especially if you use special characters, for example, German umlauts or Polish letters or Swedish letters. Um, I remember, I think it was Skype, where as soon as you type in a special character, then it would go down to 80 shards per message instead of 160. Yeah, this is um, a, uh, the SMS service uh, started first uh, with uh, something which is, which is forgotten. No, no, it's the international alphabet number two, but this was, um, this uh, this is ASCII. What is uh, in computer people 
call it ASCII telecommunications people talk it uh, international alphabet number two of the ITU but this was inadequate for for European languages so we agreed in standardization to use uh, an alphabet uh, which was optimized for the European languages and this was developed in the context of uh, the standardization of paging yeah. do you recall still what paging is radio paging yeah, um, I've it's, heard. It's, I've heard of it. One way, one way. It was used also in private environments, in hospitals, etc. A small pager in the pocket. And oh yes, those pagers. Yeah. Now I know. I remember. Yeah. for European system, which was called ERMES, European Radio Messaging System, but this did not come to life. And but they had an interesting alphabet. Uh, which was optimized for most European, uh, Western European languages. And this was used initially in, in SMS as the only alphabet. And then we got complaints from China and from the Arab countries. When GSM came to, to the Arab countries was the first complaint that it was not possible to use Arab char char characters. And then it, it, we got big complaints from China. And uh, then uh, as an alternative, alphabet Unicode was used. The, uh, the Hermes alphabet and the ASCII is an 8-bit, eight 8-bit eight uses 8-bit per character, and Unicode uses 16-bit uh, per character. Uh, that is, uh, Unicode is used as standard in computer systems these days, since it allows many, many languages uh, to use it uh, properly. And uh, the system switches then to Unicode, and then you have half of the capacity. Ah, that was UTF-8, and UTF is 16, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Ah, I see, I see. Th that is because it used a different alphabet. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, a interesting thing is, you mentioned it um, before before we had this conversation here. My, my original, uh, my original, in its um, initial reason to to get in uh, get in touch with you and do this interview was actually that I read in German media that a co-inventor of SMS died from Finland, but then you sent me you sent me that link in an email that originally this wasn't the case. If you could explain that a bit. Yeah, there is. Um in the internet, you find a name as father of SMS, a name of a Finnish guy, Mati Makonen. Uh, this uh, Mati Makonen, um, th this story came to life in uh, in the ni 90s. There was a question, who has invented SMS? And there was also no, co no big name connected to anything in GSM from Finland. And Nokia was so strong, and the, the Finnish wanted so badly to find some big Finnish name uh, somewhere. And then a lady uh, reporter from uh, a Helsinki, Helsingin Sanomat, a big newspaper, the biggest newspaper in the country, interviewed a uh, then Nokia manager who had been working with the operator before. And this uh, was Mati Makonen, and he made an incautious remark that he had thought about sending texts via mobile phones in a, in a and that he had mentioned this to Finnish colleagues in a pizzeria in Copenhagen and then this lady said well this is the invention of SMS and she blew this story up and this story was uh, was then uh, propagated big in Finland and then he was so proud and uh, Mati did not uh, have the courage anymore to object to this. Then this uh, took, the, took the internet, and then it was, pro was pro promoted via the internet. And, uh, and then he, he was so proud, and he was uh, even received awards for this, etc. But uh, Mati Makonen has not uh, written anything down, he has not contributed anything to the to the uh, development of uh, SMS. He has not participated in any meeting of any group who had done this work. He has not told, talked to anybody. And uh, so the, the uh, so one can only say uh, that this is uh, a total uh, in a in, in media and internet hype. The truth is that I have sat down in 1984 
Um, I have made papers and discussed these with, we worked together with France Telecom at the time. I have talked to Bernard Gilbert and Bernard and I have, have submitted a first, contribu first contributions on SMS in early 1985 into a meeting of this European GSM group in Stockholm, in, in, in Norway, in Oslo. And these papers have still survived time. So they, they are, these papers still exist. These are contributions from, they are of course, not, as it was the, the case, no names on it, but they were France and Germany as source mentioned and nothing from, from Nordic countries. And then we, Bernard and myself, we have looked after, after this, during this standardization. Then in 1987, a data communications group was set up in the uh, in the standardization of this mobile communication systems I became the first chairman of this group and I have then in, uh, uh, created a subgroup dealing with uh, with SMS and the first chairman of this subgroup was fi was Finn Trosby of Telenor and Finn has is has really overseen and managed the development of the first phase of the SMS standards and he has a big merit, big, uh, big piece of work, and he deserves big recognition for the, for the work he has done. Uh, then these uh, contributions during this time came already from the UK, and the next chairman of this group became Kevin Holly of O2, uh, who has been, I think, chairman for then 10 years, and then Ian Harris, the final chairman. And so these three, are, three other colleagues deserve a lot of merits in the detailed development of, of SMS and uh, and uh, not uh, this Finnish guy who has done nothing about it. Yes, when, when, when I had an interview um, via Skype video with Marty Cooper in February, who, who invented the mobile phone, he said that everything in telecommunication was a team effort. One, one person had the idea and the other ones had to realize the technical possibility and development. So it was always a group of people. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I mean, the, there are, but there are also clearly phases. There is a first phase where you must have a, a vision what the service could be and what the functionality could be, but then you do not yet know whether this is feasible. Uh, and then people with really good technical knowledge must step in and they must, of course, bring in um, many, many more uh, good ideas also and, and, and a lot of, of detailed work in order to, to, to really make it work. Um, but during my research about you, I found sources that you even invented the concept of uh, global roaming, I think it's called, that you can call each other um, from abroad and to abroad all over the world. Um, no, I wouldn't say this. No, uh, I no, no. This is certainly not the case. I mean, uh, the idea um, you have, if you look at roaming, you have uh, roaming means that a base, a mobile station can roam in a network. The network has many cells. It's, each <laughs> cell is uh, is as uh, has a base station, and a mobile station can roam from cell to cell. And also, you have uh, several network areas, it can roam everywhere. This is national roaming. And th then this existed in cellular networks, in the analog cellular networks already. Network C in Germany or the Nordic metro network NMT had this national roaming. Then there was the idea, but be before, be before I was even in mobile communications, NMT had international roaming between the Nordic countries. Our network B had international roaming between uh, the Benelux countries and Austria and Germany. So the vision of international roaming existed and uh, also uh, some, some of the technical work had, had or was ongoing when I came in. I have no, no uh, um, I have uh, only uh, more on a, on a sub aspects. I, I realized when, uh, when all technical work was pretty w well underway I realized that there was one gap and there was nobody looking after the transmission of the charging data which a roamer uh, created in a visited network. I mean, if a roaming station goes into an inter a foreign network, then there are call data records. And these call data records need to come back to the home network. 
and need to be charged to the end user in, in, in some form. And for this data transmission, nobody nobody did care about it. And this, this I discovered, and uh, I even proposed a group for this. Uh, this was done in the GSM association framework, and uh, the, but the I, I then could only propose the chairman for it. This is Michael Giesler. You might have heard his name. Michael Giesler is the, I would say, the father of the of the roaming of, of T-Mobile and also has a big contribution to the international uh, roaming, but on the side of, of uh, charging and accounting. But uh, I have only, only uh, limited uh, contributions there. Mm. Another contribution I, I've um, read about is let me add one sentence that yeah. if you have if you have once this inter, in, in a standard this in functionality of international roaming then you can apply this to european networks which follow this standard and you can also apply this to to let me say an australian network or a chinese network or an arab network and then yeah. you have roaming it's it's quite interesting i mean um since since two years or something i discovered that um the the mobile network in, in Africa is pretty advanced. I mean, I could do um, I could do a Skype video call with somebody from Burundi in Africa or from Uganda or something, whereas here in Europe and in other countries that are uh, more developed, um, you have the problem there, there there is a data limitation so big that you barely can make a video phone call, or 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 the the the, the speed is so slow because of so many users in the mobile network. Yeah, but I mean, these are practical problems. I mean, the of course, the network operators uh, are being mm -hmm. surprised, uh, especially by the amount of video traffic. And video eats, eats uh, uh, huge quantities of, of uh, capacity in the networks, and they put a lot of effort in expanding the, the capacities in, in developed countries. I mean, but I think these are in principle transitional problems. I mean, this is not a principle problem. It's a problem of dimensioning a, a network and of uh, expanding the capacity of networks. And, and, and of and course, in the developed, in underdeveloped countries, you don't have much data traffic and then you have the network maybe alone. So the problem is also, as you mentioned earlier in the interview, the investment of capacity and expanding the network, because you also want to make a profit on the other hand. Yeah, I mean, uh, you if you have a network, you, you will uh, dimension this according to the traffic you expect. Every network operator makes forecasts for the traffic they expect, and, and then they expand uh, the network accordingly. And then they try to calculate charges, uh, which uh, allow them to recover the investment cost and make some profit. I mean, this is a normal normal business model. Also, a car manufacturer would not would not build a factory for ten thousand cars a day if he can sell only hundred. So as soon as you bump to the limit, you expand, but not before. Yeah, because you, you you do this before you 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 make a forecast. Yeah. Before and you expand it before you reach the capacity. Since if you, if you ex, if the capacity, if the traffic exceeds your capacity, you have also loss of income. Since uh, people don't don't. Uh, but of course, the, with the flat rates, it's not exactly loss of income. Then you have only a deterioration of quality of service. But in the long term, you have also a loss of income. That's true. Yeah. Um, well, interesting um, mentioning this um, mobile communication is that here in Germany, for example, most providers forbid you to use VoIP over the mobile internet. So you may not even use a Skype or WhatsApp or any other voice application because they they fear that they would lose customers who would use those web applications rather than their airtime, I guess. Yeah, but uh, with VoIP you use also airtime. <laughs> yeah, but but, uh, but they want to protect the charging model. I mm. mean, I, I do not, I do this. This is a, a commercial strategy of uh, segmenting the market. 
this may work for some time, but you saw how this uh, happened in, in SMS. They wanted to protect the relatively high rates. Uh, and uh, and what they, did they do? They, they are now losing the, the, the market, market, the total market. To third party applications like WhatsApp uh, yeah. or Facebook Messenger or something. Yeah. iMessage or. Um, I, I also read you had to play into the, um, the frequency um, of 3G that were, well, um, I don't know how you say it, um, that were sold to the providers back in 1998, I think it was. And you were you were the chairman, and you were responsible for giving those frequencies away. No, 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 no. No, I was responsible for the development of the standard at that time. Ah, that uh, was it. Was okay. The chairman of the ETSI European Telecommunication Standards Institute, Technical Committee (SNG) Special Mobile Group. That was a pretty big organization. That we had a plenary was 150 to 250 delegates. We had 11 subcommittees and 45 subgroups, so it was a pretty large machinery, and we developed, in my time, all what it was called GSM Phase 2, that was the data services, GPRS, Edge, and such things, but also localization services, and we developed the transition to 3G to, and the, the fundamentals of, the, uh, of UMTS. And, uh, I, I proposed actually the creation and transition to 3GPP to this international global organization, uh, but I was not responsible for the spectrum auction. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was done by European governments. So you you had you had a part into that um, development of um, of mobile internet, you could say. Yeah. yeah. So that is what that what we are talking now. And the development nowadays um, that we have data traffic on our mobile or smartphone and so on, that is something you had a part in. So are you pleased with how it developed in the end? Uh, it's, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming how this developed. I mean, this is unbelievable. I mean, uh, even the speeds, if you see, uh, 3G was good already, but I'm now a really, real lover of LTE. And if you see how fast this goes, and then um, if you see the development of these applications, the apps, that is really, I think, a key to it. That uh, that it's become so easy to use, um, and it's but also the social networks, and uh, it's it's unbe unbelievable how much creativity this has set free. And uh, how how big possibilities exist these days? It's it's fascinating. Um, you mentioned you also had a hand in the development of um, of um, uh, lo localization. So even that, um, I think it's called GPS. No, GPS is uh, GPS is a satellite system which yeah. sends which sends uh, signals to the Earth and a. And a mobile terminal can receive several satellites and can calculate from the satellite signals where its location on the globe is. This is a totally independent system. Now, these were efforts in a mobile step in a mobile network to identify where is the location of the mobile station, and also where is the. Uh, this main means in terms in which cell are they and in which part of the cell uh, you can do there some something more to to locate this. This is, of course, interesting for uh, for emergency calls that the that the people can know where the emergency case uh, takes place and such things. We developed uh, mechanisms how to what can be done in a mobile network for this and how can this be used by let me say emergency services. How can this be can this be a a, a, a can this be used by other clients? Uh, can other people use your no, your localization data, of course, only if you have agreed to this in such basic mechanisms. I, I would also like to add a word of caution, invented a part in the development of the mobile internet. I was had a part in the creation of the infrastructure for the mobile in internet and what then happened on this platform. This is thousands of people who have uh, done this. But we had this, 
the development, the vision of this global platform, global platform everywhere available to every mobile, wherever he is, in buildings, outside buildings, in trains, in, in, in aircraft, everywhere. Uh, this, this was the, a very big vision, which was uh, brought forward in, in my time as chairman. Quite interesting. So um, this uh, localization of cells, as you mentioned, and so on, it's also used if you have an emergency case. And I think I read there are regulations kind of that 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 um, the emergency service has like 12 minutes to or, or can locate where you are within 12 minutes or something. I think it there's it must be much faster. Yeah, well, I, I read most countries do it within five minutes or even faster. Yeah. I think it must be much faster. This must be a wrong, wrong information. <laughs> okay. It's yeah, used, it's... of course, by the criminal police. I mean, in order to locate people where they made their last calls and such things, or even uh, to to follow uh, mobile phones which are still switched on but but uh, do not make calls. So it's also quite helpful there. But the Police, of course, can access those data, such data only uh, if a court has allowed this. I see. Well, except in emergency cases, I guess if you need an emergency and you have your mobile phone with you, I guess they can locate where you are. No, if you don't have a mobile phone, then they can't locate you. Of course, if, if you don't, if you don't. Um, I think, I'm not quite sure, but I could ask you, I think... Um, on on my on my phone for example if if i don't have a gps signal it's still using such data to find out where about i am i think right yeah of course the the phone knows where you are it knows in which uh, in, in, in of course with gps it knows it very precisely uh, but uh, they have there are more is more information it knows in which cell it is registered at present uh, and uh, also there are some means to calculate where you are in a cell. But this is, of course, uh, has much less precision than GPS. How did you actually take into account what happens, as you said, you had a role in development of, of uh, GPRS and stuff, um, when there are too many users in a cell? I mean, this is something that that really happens still nowadays that sometimes you you are locked in you have you have connection to a to a um to an antenna but you cannot make calls or cannot receive sms because the antenna the station is just overloaded yeah if if something is is overloaded then it's overloaded i mean this is a question of network dimensioning this is not a question of the functionalities um and uh, i mean if you look if you look if you are in, an, in a stadium with where there is a big big uh, football match and everybody wants to wants to make a phone call when his team has won and if if one half of the stadium wants to make a phone call then you are lost mm. every network is lost you cannot build so much capacity so let me ask you, um, what's your opinion actually that that a lot of lot of services um, using nowadays apps? You said it's it's a good development, but for example, when I spoke to Marty Cooper, he said that his problem is that nowadays mobile phones have too much f f functionality that many people, especially older generation they can't cope with the functionality of a nowadays smartphone, for example. I think first um, you can configure how much you have. I mean, you can, uh, can, can delete what you do not want. Uh, you can, if you're an elder person, you can, uh, um, can en enlarge the, the, uh, the uh, symbols, you can enlarge the, uh, the characters. Uh, you can configure it. Um, many, many other people probably don't know this sufficiently. Also, I mean, the, the question of the first installation of, of mobile phones is, is a, for some people, a, a little bit a difficult area. 
And I mean, if they would, would then take some help for this, or if the service providers would offer some help for this, this could be relatively easily done. I don't know, perhaps the, the manufacturers could also offer, let me say, a, a simple mode and an advanced mode. Uh, I saw this many years ago on a Nikon camera, where you could uh, switch in a, in, a, uh, in a standard mode and an experts mode. And uh, your, your menus uh, had very different uh, content and structures. But um, all in all, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, there has been a lot of effort to, to simplify the, the operation of mobile phones. If you recall uh, the, the old, old phones, if you see what, what was done by Nokia in those years, this was a big, were big steps forward. But if you look now, what has been these days done by, pe by people like Apple, it has become so much simpler. Uh, but if people then leave, leave everything on the phone, which is, comes with the phone, if they don't delete what they want, I mean, then they have a mess. Or if they don't order these things in a proper things, I, I got my phone with, I think, three screens full of symbols. I mean, if you don't throw away what you don't want, Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't complain that you have have a lot of choice. You, you should then make your choice and simply throw it away what you don't want and then. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I remember having, um, um, as I said, the Siemens uh, C five. I think it was. Um, in 1999, I remember back then to be able to send SMS and send messages and make calls to a prod or receive calls or SMS. I had to enter a service code to enable the provider um, or to enable the phone to actually make international calls and messages. And nowadays, you you don't you don't have to think about where you go. I mean, nowadays. The smartphone has like four frequencies that it can handle. So, I guess I guess it really really changed a lot in the last twenty years alone. Yeah. Nowadays, nowadays it's an, it's a no brainer. You no longer have to have to think about if your if your mobile phone will work in China or in Japan or something. Yeah, I recall my first phone, which could work in the United States. You had to switch the frequency band manually. When I came back, I forgot to switch it back to the European bands, and I had, my phone didn't work at home, and it lasted quite some time until I found what the reason was, <laughs> that I had simply forgotten to switch back to the European frequency bands. But this is all hidden now to you. It, it is hidden that it that it is a radio device. It's a mobile phone. It's not a... a a mobile station anymore. Yeah, and it's so much simpler, and uh, I mean, so much uh, enthusiastic. And uh, if you see, uh, see also other people, uh, if they, it's it's not bad to have a little bit of challenge also as an elder person to to keep your brain working. <laughs> Well, of course, for you, for you, you, we have to take into account you. You had your part into that, your invention that, and as you said yourself, you were always into electronics. Um, yeah, but I mean, look, I, I, my my basis was was hardware and was hardware development, was uh, transmission equipment development, network network engineering, and such things. And uh, for instance, computing, I. I, I had to learn to, to handle, to, to work with, mob, with uh, PCs when I was uh, 54. I, I had to restart. I had work, done programming work on, on big machines, mainframes uh, at university and, and some time later. But uh, to, work, uh, to work day by day with a PC, I was a big, big boss in, in the D1 development and uh, had a big staff and I had not to work with, with a PC myself. But with 54, I started this. and. Uh, this was also not easy, but uh, but learning to, to read and write was also not easy. That's that's quite interesting because my mom learned how to use a computer at the same age. Yeah, and nowadays it's a no brainer. I mean, we Skype like we Skype now. It's so easy. Yeah, but it's also the the uh, if you look at things like Skype, the the value which uh, elder people extract from using this uh, is justifies, of course, a lot of effort in learning things. 
That, that are good words. Yeah, but, that's true. But I mean, this, this. Uh, I mean, if an elder person starts using a computer, they should use today a tablet. By no way use a PC with all the complications. Use a tablet and then you go to the internet and, and uh, then you have a lot of fun and uh, it's not too difficult. You don't have to worry about, you know, um, hacking software or viruses so much. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, to some extent, yes, but not to, not, not to that extent you have on a PC. Yeah. That's true. Um, yes, but interestingly is, um, interesting is you, you still work nowadays. I'm actually, this is how I got in touch with you over your homepage. Nowadays you work in uh, p um, patents, um, law, consultation and stuff? Not, not, not law. Law? Not no? Law. We, we, no, we, we provide uh, expert, um, expert opinions and expert reports on patents in litigations. Um, you have certainly uh, read in the newspapers about the big litigations between Qualcomm and Nokia, between Apple and Ericsson, Apple and Nokia, etc. And in all such cases, uh, um, expert opinions are needed by by independent uh, experts, and I have collected a network of more than 50 uh, independent experts, and we can provide to our clients uh, independent expertise on on the value of patents. For instance, if uh, our a typical case is if our cli our client is a smaller man manufacturer who is uh, confronted by a, a owner of a big portfolio with a huge, huge requirement for, for huge royalty. Then, uh, and they say, this, this patent owner says, you are violating all these and these and these patents. And then we look for our clients, uh, whether he really infringes these patents, whether these patents are still valid, etc., etc. And we provide such uh, advice, advisory services to, to our clients. And this is what we do now since more than 10 years. And um, as you say, you are doing this pa uh, patent thing. But by, I believe since, since you were part of the governmental German Postal Service back in the 80s and later, I guess you, you never um, got patents yourself secured for the invention of SMS no, and was, some uh, things? This was a big mistake. I should have filed some SMS patents and then collect 1.1% uh, 1, 1 of each uh, message set. Yeah, because yeah. that's something that's, that's appearing in a lot of interviews that are done with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this question is often asked in a lot of interviews you gave that why you didn't do that yeah i mean this was um, i mean this was our spirit we were part of the civil service and we we, we uh, our, our our mission was to provide a good telecommunications infrastructure for for the population of the country we were in a monopoly situation and it was our our duty to provide the best what is possible and and to make make efforts to to achieve this and uh, we saw this as part of of our normal job i mean Perhaps it was a little bit uh, naive, but uh, or at least non-commercial, let me say. But we we did we were not commercial. Also, if I look at, at the salaries I have earned at that time, I mean it's uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's in the same category. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, this was the the time and was the framework we worked in. Um, the the market was not privatized and liberalized. So if you wanted to work on in this sector, you had to go to this. Uh, government agency and uh, have, have to work there. And nowadays and you, you try to help people that they don't do the same mistake by giving expertise with patch, uh, patents, I guess, no, in I think a way. We, we want, what we want, uh, a lot of patents which have been, uh, in, in mobile communications, you, uh, you, you need to apply a lot of technical specifications in order that the system functions. Uh, at present, these are 25,000 pages of, of standard, which are which are applicable and which must be fulfilled. And a lot of people have patents on on nitty gritty details and many 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 areas. And they try, since the industry has become so big, they try to collect their share. 
this is this is fine for me but there are also people who, who have patents which should have never been granted since these things have been invented before and have been published before um, we we were able to to show in in, in cases uh, in, in, in 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 certain court cases that 80 or 90 percent of the patents should have been never awarded the patent offices have done a very bad job in, in, in scrutinizing whether this is really an innovation there have been patents awarded for things which were no innovations. Can you tell me as, as, uh, an example? Oh, there were many things in transmission, but I, I couldn't right off my head take a, a simple example, but it were uh, alg algorithms and, and, and mechanisms and, 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 and protocol protocol details, etc. It, it were we had one case where one, one company uh, maintained that they had 35 patents which would be uh, infringed by our client and uh, we were able to show that that uh, 30, 32 were not uh, were either not uh, essential were not uh, not essential to the standard or were, were should never have been awarded I mean there are many many cases many uh, many court cases you need just to look into uh, the the court uh, proceedings in, 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 in several countries in Germany in UK in US uh, that that uh, patents are revoked in, in quantities and uh, I mean uh, those who have really contributed inventions should have their, their merit but uh, those who have not contributed things we have we found a case which is extreme where one guy was in a meeting where a guy from another company mentioned an idea, this guy went home and, and filed a patent with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. Yeah. This is, I mean, would say this is near to criminal. Well, yeah, the, this is kind of a borderline, I guess. Um, so it's interesting because many inventors like yourself they still work nowadays. Did you did you ever consider not doing anything, just enjoying your life? And well, I enjoy my life. I have uh, I I concentrate uh, since two years on the management of my company, and uh, um, I have a, a a colleague who who works now full time with us, who has taken all day by day business, and also in the years before, I have uh, stepped back from really do technical work since also my knowledge becomes outdated and uh, and uh, if I if I look at 3G it's difficult for me already and 4G is I'm ne nearly a lay uh, know some principles but uh, I, but uh, there we need uh, people younger people people with, uh, with young, younger know-how I mean uh, and uh, so I have uh, Step, over time, I have stepped down in the in the number of hours I work. At present, I I am still working in something like uh, one or two hours a day. I so see. This is more or less entertainment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Or are, are you giving interviews step, like nowadays? And, and, uh, and um, are you happy with the development that that is that well that is showing face nowadays? I mean. You said you are quite um, overwhelmed by what is now the case, how society changed and so on. But is there anything you would have changed seeing the current development? Difficult to say. I mean, um, um, this is, uh, of course, uh, if I look at my own things, uh, one could have things, things done differently. Um, but uh, this is also this is also about uh, about the a very big uh, successful uh, development of a network of people a network of of companies and uh, an individual plays only a limited role you have an influence on certain elements of the development and you can certainly set directions or contributing to setting new directions but then this must be accepted and then people must step in must bring this to life you, you mentioned this team effort and this becomes even more if more difficult if if new technology needs to be developed i mean even the first gsm phones needed a new technology in in, in, in silicon uh, to 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 come to life and uh, then you need 
then there are very broad, broad uh, participation is needed. And uh, and I mean, in by and large, I think I, I I am happy that I was that I could be part of this development and could play a role in in certain elements in in, in GSM and the D1 network and later in the international developments. And I mean, uh, this is a of course a privilege if you have the, a position to to contribute to such a to such a story. So you're general happy. You wouldn't not really. Yeah, more, more than happy. I mean, what what uh, can you expect from your professional life? What more can you expect? Well, I guess back then in '84, you didn't really you didn't really plan on being one of those big inventors of technology. No, it was a it was a, a concept, a, 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 a service and a technology concept for for SMS and uh, and uh, it it was designed to the framework which as it was at the time we used the possibilities like in, like making it mandatory for every for every terminal etc. And we looked after it. I looked after it during the standardization process and accompanied it un, until it became into life. And I mean this was a successful route those days these days uh, there are much there are very different routes to success and uh, I, I had never expected that this would become such a big success but uh, but also I mean uh, nobody had expected that the GSM standard would become such a big success that it would we even had were in doubts whether we could achieve a European acceptance in all European countries or a uh, and then not to speak about uh, the rest of the world, I mean, or, or the world, I mean, this was uh, totally unexpected. And also the development of hand portables. I mean, at the time when we did this early development, we had a very limited spectrum. And the focus was on car, car mobile stations and uh, ship mobile stations and, and such things. There were people who said, if somebody was a who could have a mobile phone hand portable uh, wants to use it? He better should go to a to to a, to a phone or coin box, uh, since we need the scarce spectrum for the for the development of of uh, of communications with cars and cars and ships, etc. But um, due to the uh, big political developments uh, with the uh, Breakdown of the Soviet Union and the big, big peace time we had in Europe, a lot of military used spectrum became free, and and this, only this gave us the possibilities to, to 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 to, uh, to enable uh, the, the large use of of hand portable stations. In early days, it was, it was de debated heavily whether the network, the GSM network, should support hand portable stations at all, mm -hmm. since the spectrum was so scarce but uh, happily the early decisions were correct that uh, there were a number of functions provided which support a good good transmission quality for and portables and uh, when and then the big political developments came so this these hand portables is a part of peace dividend we have these days only the big big spectrum uh, which was available enable this and then of course technological progress if you see what what is these days in such a such such a small device it's, it's unbelievable <laughs> well it's um it's like a computer with a huge battery <laughs> inside no, it's so. much more than a, than a pc yeah. i mean it's uh, al al already i mean uh, gsm phones which are 10 years old had more more uh, 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 compute, computing power in, in number of mega instructions per second than a workstation at the time. They were always much more, much more powerful than, than PCs. And, and if you look at these, these days, this is... There's one discussion that is coming up every couple of years. How, um, well, how bad is the radiation of mobile phone and antennas and stations for your health. I mean, there are some cases where studies where people say it even can cause cancer, and some say that's that's uh, nonsense. That's not not the case. Our last question was um, if radiation from the mobile phone has influences on the 
helps because there are a lot of reports and researches that have been done about how uh, it can affect or support getting cancer and stuff. Well, in general, I think the situation has become fairly quiet. I mean, in former years, we had a lot of of, uh, of uh, excitement and, and reports, etc. And now it's really quiet. Um, and uh, if, especially if you consider that there are now more than 5 billion users. So two out of three people on earth use it. And if it would have really big impacts, we should see see thousands or, or, or hundred thousands of, of ill people. Uh, this is, let me say, a general comment. Um, let's discuss a little bit uh, why, why this comes. I think um, there is a physical reason for it. The electromagnetic radiation has uh, as a me mechanism uh, to impact uh, on human bodies, which is can be distinguished into ionizing radiation and non-ionizing ra radiation. Ionizing means a radiation which changes the electrical status of your atoms in the in your body. This is uh, this type of electromagnetic waves are, for instance, Röntgen radiation or radiations from nuclear reactions. X-ray in English. Yeah, that's uh, since they don't like to acknowledge that there is a German inventor of these. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't know that was the reason yeah. actually, but okay. Yeah, but um, th this was also with kilohertz and kilocycles. Uh, but um, uh, and the, but all radio waves belong to the non-ionizing uh, nature. This means they do not change the electrical status of your atoms in your body. And this means there is also no dosage. So there is no impact which is accumulated. Uh, accumulated. So what you see on, uh, from radio waves on human bodies is if you have high power, then you the body absorbs it and then the the water is cooking and you are burning. This uh, is an effect which you have at high power radio stations and such things. But in uh, low power applications, what we discuss here, um, no, no uh, heating uh, effect does, it, does exist. So, I mean, from this elementary distinction, I think it follows that there should be no impact on human bodies. and. Uh, I mean, this large experiment seems to confirm it. We can also look a little bit on the technical situation in cellular networks. Cellular networks are compared to radio networks, uh, radio um, uh, station networks are low power networks. A typical VHF transmitter has something like 100 kilowatts or so. A typical mobile station, has, a mobile base station has 10, 10 watts per, 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 per transceiver. That means they may have two or three transceivers, then it's 20 or 30 watts. And this is peak power. Uh, the, um, this, is, this is the nominal peak power. I mean, in, in radio network planning, uh, the designers uh, limit this peak power uh, to an amount which is necessary to cover the cell. And this is normally much lower since you want to reuse the spectrum uh, in a, as short distance as possible. So you, you design a cell in such a way that you have a nominal value at the cell boundary. And, and then there is uh, during communication is another mechanism. There is power control. Uh, each uh, communication in each communication, the power level on both sides, the hand portable and the base station is reduced to a minimum, to the minimum necessary to uh, guarantee the, the planned quality of the connection. And this again is done in order to, uh, to avoid a pollution uh, in, in a greater distance by this uh, frequency so that you can reuse it soon. So on average, we have a 
a mobile station has a peak power of 2 watts and this means on 8 channels uh, and the mobile uses only one channel out of these 8 so it's on average a peak power of a quarter of a watt and uh, by this power control mechanisms on average it's some 20, 30, 40 milliwatt which is used for, for transmission so this is really very very low power and so I mean uh, together with the physical explanation I gave earlier I think this uh, shows that there is really no danger and uh, I mean we have this now these networks now on a large scale since more than 20 years and uh, so I, I see no reason to be concerned how this. about those small amount of groups about people that say they are um, sick of those radiation that actually well live live in in the outback somewhere where there's no mobile phone reception and so on or else they get sick well there is of course a, a psychological point if you believe that you can get sick then you can get sick from everything but um, there is, are these people who's, who maintain um, that they are electrosensitive. And uh, this is a, a, for a long time, a, a subject of scientific research. And the, the um, result is so far the human beings have no means to, to be sensitive to electromagnetic uh, radio waves. So you, you can, and uh, the, uh, there are an, is a number of universities who would like to find people who are le really electrosensitive, as they say. And they have installed laboratories, and there they make blind tests whether these people are electrosensitive. And to my knowledge, a number of people have gone to these laboratories, and in each case, it could be shown that they were not electrosensitive. And so one must say this is a psychological phenomenon. Mm. Okay. To my mind. So all in all, using a mobile phone is not dangerous at all. No, I mean there's the, the contrary. If you see how many lives are saved by mobile phones, uh, I mean look at look at uh, traffic uh, traffic crash situations, etc., or look, uh, look at emergency situations uh, at, at sea and other opportunities. Look at. Uh, big earthquakes where they can call immediate help. I mean, there are certainly between 10 and 100,000 lives saved and uh, there is uh, no, no proof that anybody has really been harmed. Um, what is your opinion about the disadvantages of the techno technology uh, development? For example, let's say you s you're sending anonymous or um, calls or SMS you know you I mean nowadays you have caller ID suppression so people can't see who's who's calling and they get harassment by by um, by such calls that's also kind of disadvantage in a way yeah but I mean um, this is more and more a phenomenon in in, in email uh, in email with this mass mass transmissions, it was in SMS uh, at a time where they could, where some operators offered a large bulk tariffs for people who sent large quantities of messages. But this is gone. I think the operators don't grant such things anymore. I think in SMS this has been disappeared, and this is called by the simple has simply disappeared by the sad fact. That the, that the sender of a message must pay for it. And uh, even if it's uh, small quantities, uh, this is not suitable then anymore for, for this uh, mass phenomenon you see in email. And in email, it's really a problem uh, which is caused by the fact that uh, email was not developed as a, properly as a telecommunication service, but it was developed by computer people who, uh, who wanted, uh, let me say, free communications and uh, they used least line capacities uh, which they had available mainly in the research community and this has never been properly developed or, or only in, into a complete telecommunication service. If you would need, would need to pay for, let me say, an email, let me say, to just two cents, this would not kill any application, then these, uh, these uh, mass uh, um, spam phenomena would be 
would completely disappear. Um, but so we have to live with it, we have to build uh, com complex filters, etc., uh, due to a misconstruction of the commercial model. But you still have problems with prank calls, unsocial calls that you don't want to receive, or SMS from somebody you don't know that well, is... It's simply deleted. Yeah. Or is such a call, an anonymous call. Some people don't accept anonymous calls. My wife does, for instance, not not uh, accept an anonymous call. Nobody forces you to do this. That's actually true, yeah. I mean, I mean, you can, for example, you can uh, configure a router and say, block all um, yeah. anonymous calls, for example, yeah. Um, so yes, so what do you think is the next step in development of um, text-based or let it be voice-based communication? Well, it's, this is difficult to, to, uh, to, to imagine since there is so much available already and uh, I must say my, my fantasy is uh, it's a little bit, uh, there is a little bit lack in my fantasy. I mean, there is, things can be faster, picture, pictures can be, be more brilliant, higher resolution, perhaps we will see 3D pictures and, and such things, but uh, this all will be a little bit evolutionary, I think. Uh, I do not see big revolutionary things. Okay, so you don't think there will be the next big thing? Um, I, I guess I guess right now, at least here in Germany, they are trying to focus on the medical possibilities, um, how you can use telecommunication and um, SMS for emergency situation or for monitoring situations of patients. Yeah, certainly a lot, a lot of work is ongoing on machine-to-machine -machine communications. Uh, there is uh, SMS is a good candidate as a as a carrier carrier for transmission for this, uh, but this is these are uh, remote remote maintenance and 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 all such things. But these are also very 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 different markets, and I I don't know whether this will be one big next big thing. Look, even Apple has no big next, uh, next thing. The watch is not such a success as as uh, many people told, uh, uh, guess that Apple doesn't publish uh, figures for the watch. So you don't think that um, that fitness watches um, will be will be really a big thing? Because that is, as you mentioned, the Apple Watch, they're really trying to make you fitness trackers and so on. But they don't dare to publish with figures, sales figures. Uh, and I've tried to, try, I've tried to, sell, to sell a, uh, what is this, a band around your watch working with an iPhone for, for fit, fitness control to my a daughter. Wrist? Yeah, a wristband? A wrist, wristband. wristband uh, for, for such uh, fitness things. To my daughter for her for her birthday day, and I, I got it back. I said, "Papa, this is not my not me. I'm I'm more yoga type." And <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think one one thing which we where we where we need really big efforts is the is the acceptance of these things in society. Uh, if you see how people use their phones, for instance, if if they are in a conversation, if a phone rings, then they immediately interrupt the. The contact and and go aside and or we were not recently invited for a very nice dinner there was a very nice lady who went from the table during a dinner three or four times uh, and and her, her dishes got cold and and such things or, or other behavioral things that people i read the other day that uh, 25 percent of of all young people check uh, their, uh, their social networks uh, already before they get, get breakfast and um, or other things that uh, bosses expect you to, that you answer emails uh, around the clock and wherever you are in the world. I mean, we, we must develop a code, a code uh, how these things are can, can be used in a, in a human way. 
Yeah, but I guess, but I guess, as you are the inventor of SMS, I mean, you couldn't foresee the development, and in a, in a way, you are not responsible for how people are using your invention. This is true, but I mean, uh, the, this invention exists 20 years, and why, why has there not been a, a type of code of conduct being developed over all these years? Oh, I read an, an, a report from a from a Broadway theater where they have 20% of their of their of their uh, visitors using their phones during a during a performance mm. and they were discussing whether they should block this forbid this but then the director said hey stop we want to be present on the social networks and, and this is publicity for us so we must find a fine balance there's one other theater where they put these people who want to use their phones into the four last rows in the room, uh, since this, uh, this irritates the actors if they see the lights in the, in the audience. And uh, so we define a, a, the proper balance in, in society. I think th there are other people, uh, there is the action of other people called than you and me. I mean, uh, there are so many people who deal with uh, with uh, philosophical and, and, and behavioral, moral, and, and other issues, and, and what do they do? They, they just write critical uh, things about these, these new possibilities. It's On the uh, finding forward a creative way. On the other hand, there are places where it worked. For example, in the cinema, I don't see people sending texts to each other. Yeah, we have also in, in Bonn, if you go to a concert in, in the Beethoven Hall in my, my hometown Bonn, there is a nice announcement before the performance start. They say, when you leave the room after the performance, mm. please don't forget to switch on your phones again. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Yes, um, yes, another point you have mentioned is the acceptance of society, of your um, invention. Um, as you mentioned earlier in the first part of the interview, it took a lot of years until the public really used SMS as a normal thing, as a primary conversation and, and uh, as a primary way of conversation. And you said that it was the youngsters who actually discovered, oh, I can send SMS. So. Um, That's, that's an interesting point because I was doing an interview with Chuck Peddle who invented the first um, sheep microprocessor in 1977 and he said that back then people said oh no computers will make um, teachers not needed anymore computers will, will, um, will cost us to lose jobs and so on so but, but I guess in your case um, of, of SMS, there was no such fear that it would cause negative results into the so society, right? No, you see, uh, SMS we see these today as a big thing, but then it was a side effect on, telephone, on a telephone. People were so proud to have these, these telephones that they could finally have mobile phones and then portable mobile phones. I can recall one Vodafone director who said, Why on earth should I write a message with this clumpy, clumsy uh, keyboard when I ca can call the person? I mean, uh, this was a very tiny side effect which nobody was interested in. Everybody was so proud that they finally could speak and could be reached when they were, were traveling or walking, etc. So this was uh, totally hidden and uh, nobody was hearing anything nobody was even thinking of using it <laughs> yeah that's uh, that's right so um, I guess the hype as you said started at the at the 90s well the, the okay. first usage was practically the operators used it when you had a message on your voicemail it, they sent you a, a short message when there was a message on your voicemail this was the first usage but this was for a long time the only one And then it was on all phones, it did sit on all phones, and then really young people did, did discover it. And, uh, and they used it, and they, uh, they used it, and they liked it since it was cheap. It, it, was, 
it was something which the adult people couldn't do and didn't do, so it was their own, so it became a part of the youth culture. And then there are these nice, all of these nice scenes where a grandparent, grandfather uh, gave, uh, gave a phone as a donation to a child and then the child explained the grandfather how to use SMS. Oh yes, I saw that video on, on YouTube, I think it was, right? Yeah, <laughs> I saw that one where, where the grandmother <laughs> says it's so complicated. <laughs> and then the young people develop these, uh, these acronyms and uh, abbreviations so that the, again the parents couldn't see what they would, would uh, transmit. So it's, it was this type of, 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 of community where this grew. And uh, now, now interesting. Do you still use SMS? Yeah, of course. Regularly. I use SMS even uh, professionally. Uh, we were support a number of, of litigations where people sit in courtrooms, mm -hmm. where you cannot have your phone on. But all my my colleagues and the attorneys we work with, we work with law law firms, they have their phone on and receive and send short messages. Or if I know that somebody is in a meeting, uh, they normally cannot be, you, can, you cannot call them, but uh, they normally uh, have uh, have their phone on reception for short messages. So for I use it for, even professionally for really critical communications. Mm. That's interesting. And I also read something some years ago that there is something I, I never really used, flash SMS. That's something that that instantly shows the SMS on the screen of the receiver. I don't know what this is. There probably, is probably least, more recently, uh, more recently with the traffic volume, they, there was a possibility created uh, to send the SMS directly to the recipient's phone without using the server. Uh, uh, since they wanted to save capacity on service and, and they know in the network whether the recipient's phone is ready for reception and is, is, is connected to the network, is registered on the network. And then you can also send it directly to the phone. This has been created in order to, to reduce the, the usage of the SMS uh, centers. Because this is flash SMS. Ah, so, so it was kind of sold as an advantage to the customer. Yeah, it may, may be that this is also then shown as an advantage, but the, the background was really to, to, to cope with the, with the volume of traffic. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's totally interesting that in the, in the mobile and telecommunication world, people are sold things, um, but they are labeled wrongly. For example, when internet service providers, ISP started with, um, with home phone, you know, and they're saying, oh, you have a landline now, but it isn't a landline, it's voice over IP, you know. Yeah. So it's actually pretty interesting that, that they label things differently, but original and in fact, in the background is a totally different technique. It's not really a landline, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also difficult to explain things to customers in short words. They know what a landline is, and so they use this perhaps as an analogy. I have seen this over time. If you have an interview with a, with a partner who is not as knowledgeable, or if this goes more to the general public, I had this with regional newspapers, etc. If you want them to explain things, this is pretty difficult to explain things and to be precise. Mm. So you you think it's it's better to maybe make an analogic um, example even if it's not 100% correct? Yeah, you must get your message through and uh, you must okay. uh, uh, achieve that that uh, the, your audience understands what you mean and, uh, and especially if you don't have much time. I mean, I had for instance radio or TV interviews then this is very, very limited in time. And if you want to get then something useful through it, you need to be careful. Well, so far we talked for one hour and a half, so yeah. we are not really on a, on a time constraint here. Yeah, but um, this would not be on, on, on public TV. 
I figure what you read on the internet about SMS and all that things, it's not all 100% true. <laughs> yeah, there is a, a, in it, there is a lot of, of uh, lack of research. Many people publish things without sufficient res research. And uh, this is also a little bit cumbersome. And probably the pressure in, in certain institutions is high to get uh, things done and get things published, get channels filled, I don't know. Okay. Well, so I'm very happy that I had this chance to talk to you directly and to, well, to solve some riddles and to correct some false um, assumptions in the past about what you did and SMS invention and so on and how everything um, turned out so far. That's really great. Um, great. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And I have one more proposal. If you send me your postal address, I have one or two books which might be helpful as reference if you would like to receive. Wow, them. that that would be pretty that would be pretty good. Of course, of course, send I will send you my address. Address by me. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Bye. Bye.